Common Emitter Amplifier, Part 3, the grand finale. I'm sorry it's taken so long, I've been having some issues. But now, let's get to it. If you haven't seen them, the first video in this trilogy was showing you the circuit in action, giving an overview of how it works, and then demonstrating it with a physical speaker. The second video was an in-depth analysis of how the circuit functions internally. But now the important part, how to actually decide what parts to use to get your amplifier working. So we have here the standard amplifier circuit. Our input is a common grounded, we use the common ground, AC waveform, this is our volume knob, and this is our capacitor to remove any DC bias in the signal, as well as prevent this DC bias from going back into the signal. The output is the same capacitor to block the DC bias from going into the output, and then our common grounded load. The load I'll be working with is a simple speaker, that same little spooky breaker box speaker, which is 0.5 watts at 8 ohms, nominal impedance. When you see the impedance of a speaker, it doesn't mean it'll always exactly be that value, but you should basically act as if it is that value. So treat it as an 8 ohm resistor that you can put 0.5 watts across at most. Now with the standard parts we're using, I can tell you that we are not going to put anywhere near 0.5 watts. You certainly could with an amplifier like this. This amplifier is known as high fidelity, high power, meaning you have to have very strong parts or you have to have extra ones in series for resistors, parallel for transistors, and whatnot. So you can end up outputting as much power as you possibly want, as long as you have the parts for it and the power. But you don't need anywhere near that 0.5 watts to actually get an audible, comfortable signal out of it. That's more the maximum rating than a goal. So the first thing you want to do is think about your load. Like I said, 8 ohms. In fact, I'll write it down. The load is an impedance of 8 ohms and 0.5 watts. So we have our standard equations. V equals I times R and P equals V times I. So we have R and we have... P. And what's more useful? Well, we'd like to get a voltage. We're trying to decide a voltage for our supply. So we want to know basically what is the maximum voltage we can apply with no resistance. We will have a resistance. So obviously we'll use a higher voltage than this, but this is a ballpark figure. So if we combine these, we get P equals V squared over R or V equals square root of P times R. Multiply the R over and take the square root to get V. So this tells us the maximum voltage that we can have across this load if we assume it's 8 ohms and we want 0.5 watts. So the square root of 0.5 times 8 is 2 volts. So if we were just hooking up a power supply to the speaker, we would want to put no more than 2 volts on it. So we can, of course, turn it around, because you might say that number isn't very realistic. But like I said, it's a good idea to try and give you a number in your brain. So you might say, well, I have access to a 9 volt power supply. So what if we put 9 up here in this equation? So 9 times 9 over, and obviously if we put 8 in, it's not going to work. So we have to say, okay, how about a total of 100? Let's just round it up to 100. So 100 and my handy calculator solves it before I hit equals, so I can just delete and try again. So now we're getting 0.81 watts, that's no good. So let's go up to 300 ohms, and we're at 0.27. Well, as it happens, 330 is a common resistor size, and that's 0.24. So now we know that if you want to use just a single resistor to bring yourself down to this power limit with a 9 volt power supply, you're going to want about a 330 ohm resistor here. I decided to be a little safer, and also because I'm not trying to use power parts, so I chose a 470 ohm resistor here. 470 ohms. So if we calculate that out, you get 9 times 9 times 470, or rather divided by 470, is 0.17 watts. So it's a nice ballpark figure. If I'm using a nice 2N3904 signal transistor, which has a good frequency response, it can dissipate, I think it's 0.25 watts. It's somewhere around there. Maybe it's higher. But 0.17 through the speaker through here, we know it's safe. So what we have done here is we've said, all right, I've got a low enough resistance that I'll be able to put power through, but a high enough resistance that I don't have to think about my parts anymore. I'm done. It's safe. End of discussion. Obviously, if you're making a commercial product, you'll want to do 
more tight testing. But also, if you're making a commercial product, you're going to be supplying the exact wall wart, you're going to have all the resistors set, you're going to set the maximum resistance on the volume knob, so you don't have to worry about whatever the user is going to put in. This margin, if I decide to turn that up to 12, it'll still be fine. If I just plug it into my power supply and fiddle with it, it's not going to blow the circuit. So that was the hard part. Because the resistance is a necessary evil in this situation, you need it to work, you have to come up with a compromise to decide what is the right value. Now that we have this value, the rest is just math. So we have the load resistor. We'll just call it RL. And our power here is 9 volts, which we call VCC, just going with the convention. Now, I'm actually going to remove this capacitor right now. Because the circuit works with and without it, the purpose of the capacitor is to allow the signal to pass, ignoring the bias, to give you more gain. That does not affect at all our calculation of the circuit. So right now, we have to decide if we're going to call this RE. So this is L for load, this is E for emitter. We'll just say that. So we want to say V of RE. The purpose of this resistor, once again, the voltage across it, is to stabilize the bias, so it needs to be able to go up and down. It's to stabilize the circuit against the changing beta value, so it needs to go up and down a little bit. But also, your signal. When your signal varies, VRE varies. So if your signal goes too high or too low, then you might bottom out and end up turning off this transistor. And if it's too high, you might top out and end up capping against your voltage, your supply voltage. The advice given whenever I see this is you want to have 10% of the supply voltage or one volt or a couple hundred millivolts. The guy I got that from tends to use 500 millivolts. 10% of nine volts is 0.9 volts. So the advice of 500 to one volt and 900 millivolts, let's just say one volt. We have nine volts to work with taking one volt plus 0.7 volts here, so we're losing 0.7 volts. That's plenty, we got plenty of room. Now the thing is, if you turn it up to 12 volts, then sure, 10% becomes 1.2, so you could turn it up to 1.2 if you want. One volt is still probably fine. If you start going up to 24 volts or something, you might want to put it at two volts, but you just need a cushion. And for common voltages, for regular circuits, one volt seems to be a healthy cushion. You can have less, but you don't really need less. So one volt, easy. Because we're expecting the signal. The signal's not going to be high voltage. Remember that. That's the whole point of the amplifier. The signal is small. So a couple hundred millivolts, maybe one volt peak to peak would be plus or minus 500 millivolts. So we've got a volt to work with for variation in the signal and the power supply ripple and the beta ripple and all this other stuff, one volt is fine. So before we try to calculate the resistor value, we need some currents. Because remember, we're varying the current up and down. The signal is in a range, right? Zero here and it goes up and down in there. The amplified voltage does the same thing. It's zero in the middle, up and down. Well, it's not zero in the middle here. It's zero in the middle after the capacitor. So when it comes out of the transistor, it's something above zero and then something below the supply voltage and zero's in the middle and it goes up and down there. So basically, remember, the transistor can be in cutoff, which means no current. It can be in saturation when it's at the supply voltage ceiling. So full current or in between. We always want that in between because if we hit the edges, if we hit the ceiling or floor, we're clipping our signal and it's bad. We want to have a margin so we never get close just in case there's variation. So the first thing we do is we calculate the maximum current because current determines voltage. The current determines the voltage drop across the resistor and that's the voltage. So we need the current because that's what's controlled by the beta of the BJT. So the maximum current, we're just using Ohm's law to calculate it. Voltage equals current times resistance. So current current equals voltage divided by resistance. The resistance is this. We're calculating the current over this. All right, that's the current we care about, the signal current. We're trying to make sure the signal doesn't go too high or too low. So the resistance we're dividing by is just this resistor, 470 ohms. Now we're calculating the maximum current. At maximum, when this is fully conducting, right up at saturation, the collector to emitter voltage drop will be effectively zero. So the voltage drop across this resistor will be the supply voltage minus the voltage drop across this resistor, because we just have our Kirchhoff's loop. Nine volts, minus whatever volts, minus zero volts, minus one volt, so eight volts. So we have eight volts divided by 470 ohms. And I have already calculated these numbers, but I'm checking to make sure I don't screw up. So eight over 470 is correct. 17 
roughly milliamps, so roughly 17 milliamps. So when the transistor is fully open and can't be opened no more, we'll be getting about 17 milliamps going through it if the load is not there. Forget the load for a second. We're just calculating the circuit. So basically when the load is there, that 17 milliamps will split or whatever less will split. But right now we're just talking about a max of 17 milliamps. What's the minimum current? Well, that would be zero. That was easy. So now we need something called the quiescent current. So your signal goes positive, zero, negative, zero, whatever. Zero is what's called quiescent. No voltage means no current going through here because of the signal, so it's just the bias. So quiescent signal means the transistor is conducting halfway, that middle point. And for safety, for comfort, we want the middle to be in the middle. So it can swing up, it can swing down, and we just make sure it doesn't hit the top or the bottom. So I guess I can write it. We had about 17 milliamps maximum current. So our quiescent current, when it's at zero, it's in the middle, is that over two, which is about 8.5. Wow, let's try that again. 8.5 milliamps. So it's just half. So we are aiming to have 8.5 milliamps through the collector to emitter when the signal's at zero. So we get our wiggle room above and below 8.5 milliamps. We've got 8.5 up to 17 and 8.5 down to zero to work with. So I'm going to assume a beta of 100. Based on the transistor I'm using, it's actually going to be around the 40 to 80 range depending on the current. You look on your data sheet, you say, if we have 8.5 milliamps, then a beta of 100 would put it down to 0.08 or around 0.1 milliamp, which my data sheet says about 40. But 40 is not 100, so actually it's gonna be higher. You can already see it's wiggly. We're trying to sit here and figure out a number and they just don't give you it. Your beta varies by an order of magnitude nearly. So this is why electronics is full of these magic numbers. So my data sheet does say 100 beta around 10 milliamps of input current. So if the signal is louder, if there's less resistance here in the volume knob, then we're gonna have more voltage and more current and it will be higher. So this beta value that we're calculating, if it's wrong, that doesn't mean the circuit doesn't work, it means the gain is different. And we can always change it up a bit. I'm trying to emphasize that it's messy, but okay. Remember the beta independence here? This resistor and all its magical effects, which I've only partly understood, basically kind of even out the differences. Because if you put in different transistors with different betas, the circuit roughly still works, which is why it works when when the beta of a transistor varies due to temperature and other factors. So yeah, it's not gonna be 100, but 100 is a good number for BJTs. This is a common number. Some of them go up to 200, some of them go down to 80 or 40, but they all kind of roughly generally hover around 100. So if you plan for 100, it can go over, it can go under at any particular moment, and the worst you have to do is have a smaller resistor here. A full amplifier for a full product will probably have multiple amplification stages anyway, so that'll get it evened out even more. But 100 is gonna work just fine, so just go with 100. And this makes it so that you don't have to worry about which transistor you put in beyond the tolerances. That's good, that's simple. Complex now, simple later. So 8.5 milliamps is half of the maximum current we can get through this. That's where we want our midpoint. So if we're assuming a beta of 100, then 8.5 milliamps through the collector to emitter divided by 100, see, because the current through the collector equals beta times the current through the base. That's how beta works. So you can just divide by beta and you get your base current. This is the base current that we want going through the base when the signal is once again quiescent in the middle at zero because it goes higher and it goes lower at zero. We want that, which comes out to, of course, 85 micro amps, 0.085 milliamps. So now we have the current through the collector and we have the current into the base at quiescence when the signal is zero. So roughly, Ohm's law again, VRE, see, because we've got the collector current going in and the base current going in. So it's the current. So current collector plus current base times R E. V equals IR, so the voltage, one volt, equals the current, which is 85 microamps plus 8.5 milliamps, times the resistor. Well, we don't know that. Divide the current over. V over I equals R. Once again, check my numbers, because I'm paranoid. So one volt divided by, now 85 microamps is 85 times one over a million. That's an easy way to do it. Plus 8.5 milliamps is 8.5 times one over a thousand. Close everything off and we get 
about 116 ohms. So in order to have a current through the emitter of that, we have to set this voltage to make sure that happens, but in order to set the current here at 85 microamps and the current here at 8.5 milliamps, so the current out as the sum of both, and have that drop one volt, we get 116 ohms. The nearest value to that ends up being 120 ohms. So that's easy. So now I've got a 470 ohm resistor here and a 120 ohm resistor here. They're different enough to get the job done, but low enough to not gimp the current too much. So that means, let me put the voltage back, one volt. So if the transistor drops about 0.7 volts from base to emitter, another approximation that works with most BJTs, the base to emitter junction should be sitting at 1.7 volts, which means this should also be sitting at 1.7 volts if the signal is zero. So when the signal is zero, the only thing setting the voltage here is the bias, and we want that bias to be 1.7 volts. So if we have nine volts here and 1.7 volt drop here, then that leaves 7.3 volts. 7.3 plus 1.7 is nine. Now recall the assumption we made earlier. We need this current to be high. The higher the better without blowing something up, because the more current here, the less the draw through the transistor is going to matter, which makes the thing more robust. So the idea is whatever current we have here, we want at least 10 times that. So one calculation for that could be this. If we call this R2, then we want to say R2 is less than or equal to VCC minus V R1 over 10 of I B Q. Now what's all that? VCC minus R1, this is R1, R1. But that's the same as VR2. The idea of writing it this way is just to emphasize that you're using the supply voltage. Just basically a don't forget that moment. But we're doing it now, we're not going to forget, so we can simplify that and just say V bias, which looks like V bigs, but don't worry about it. So that's the V here, that's the V at the base, that's what we're trying to set. Or if it's easier, you could also just say V of R2. So once again, V over I equals R. IBQ, that's the base current at quiescent. So that's our 8.5. Now why the quiescent? Why not the max? Well, because we're trying to say less than. We want a minimum amount of current. This is the minimum value. If we make this resistor bigger, there's less current. So we want this resistor to be this or smaller. So if we use a higher current here, then R2 could end up being too big and it won't work as well. On the other extreme, we want zero current down there. So that just won't work mathematically. So the middle is nice. We're just using the middle. Like I said, this is, this is electronics. It's messy. I have learned this very quickly and I don't like messy but there you go. Stick in the middle, make it work, and then give yourself margins. That's, that's all it is, is make all kinds of assumptions and then give yourself margins. And when you're making a CPU working for Intel, you can work with tighter tolerances. When you're doing something like this, just give yourself margins. So this is 1.7. This is the voltage we want down here. And then the quiescent current was the 85 microamps. So if we have an R2 to do that, then we end up getting about a resistor value here of 1997 ohms. And we of course have to round that. So round down, because we want it smaller, to 1800. 1800 ohms is a value I have in my box. If you want to make it smaller, make it smaller. You have to watch the power going through your resistor or use multiple resistors in series so they drop some power each. But more is only going to be wasteful. The worst that happens is you waste power. The best that happens is it makes your signal more stable. If you have a really crappy power supply or really crappy wall power that's going to make it wiggle too much. So then, of course, once we have a resistor value here, then we know the other value because it's the same current. So we get for R1, see if we just change this to R1 because we want the same current through it, then we get about 8577 ohms, which again round down because more is better to about 8200 ohms. And that's actually it. The capacitors, basically that's going to depend on your signal. I'm using 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitors, which you make sure that you have the positive end towards the bias here, the positive end towards the bias here, and if you have one here, the positive end towards the emitter there. You want the same value in all three spots because it's filtering the same signal in all three spots. You want the capacitor to do its job of blocking DC while letting the AC through as unmolested as possible, and that's dependent upon frequency. 10 microfarad seems to work fairly well for me, 10 microfarad electrolytic for 
an audio signal in the human hearing range. You'll want to do your own experiments. You can look up you can look up data sheets for the capacitors you have, standard values, whatever you want. Or if you have an oscilloscope, you could just plug different ones in and look at the signal and make sure it doesn't look goofy. Or probably the easiest way, just make the circuit. Just pick a capacitor somewhere in the middle, 10 microfarads, 100 nanofarads, just stick it in there. The same one in all three spots. And then listen. If it's an audio signal, just listen. You've got the input and output and compare them. And if it's goofy, try a different capacitor value. It's sort of like trying to figure out what glasses you should wear. They switch the different prescriptions and say, is this one better or worse? Better or worse? Do the same thing. Switch capacitors and say, is it better or worse? And pick the best one. But in terms of resistors, that's all. Now that was a involved derivation, so let's summarize. And I'll clear some space. We'll just get the salient components here. The four resistors in question. So for the sake of fun, we call them R1, R2, RL, and RE. One and two for the bias, L for the load, and E for emitter. And then this is just VCC, the supply voltage. So step one is think about your load. Think about what kind of current, power, and voltage you need going across it. Pick your VCC to be nice and high above that. Give yourself a nice healthy margin. So we picked nine volts. And apparently my green marker has died. These are, without a doubt, I can really not recommend this brand, Expo Markers. I think I'm going to not buy them at all ever again, but I may as well use up the ones I have. Oh, I don't even have a new green. Excellent. The green is dead, long live the green. This is what we do to dead green markers. So for VCC, we have nine volts. Then we decide our load resistor, which in this case I picked 470 ohms. Based on how much current that can put through, resulting in how much power it can put through, I decided that is about as low as I can go while not putting too much load through any of my parts here, allowing me to wiggle this voltage if I want, allowing my signal voltage to change if I want, basically giving myself a window while still putting enough power, basically about a half to two-fifths of the allowed power through the speaker. So I said that's plenty. So now that's the fiddly bit. We also chose one volt here across this based on the advice of very smart people. So we calculate the maximum current to the collector. So IC max perhaps equals VCC minus VRE over RL. So your supply voltage minus the voltage we want here divided by the resistor here gives you the maximum current at saturation of the transistor. And the minimum current will be zero, so that's our window. So the current through the collector at quiescence when the signal is zero is the current through the collector max that we just calculated over two. We want our bias to be in the middle so it can wiggle up and down. We are assuming our beta of 100 because that'll work. So then the current through the base at quiescence is, so current through the base at quiescence is the current through the collector at quiescence over beta because beta is the multiplication factor. So now it's a division factor going the other way. So this is the base current to get this collector current if beta is 100. So that's the midpoint of the current going through here to get the midpoint of the current going through, I guess, here and thus here. We assume about VBE equals 0.7. That's another standard value for a BJT. Sometimes it's 5.5, 0.6 to 0.7 most commonly. 0.7 is a nice, healthy, safe value to assume. And again, and that's another reason to have this a little higher than it needs to be because that can vary between transistors. So 1 plus 0 0.7, 1 0.7 is the total voltage from the input end of the base out to ground through the emitter. So that V bias equals voltage from base to emitter plus voltage the emitter resistor. So one volt is VRE, 0.7 is about VBE. So that's our V bias. That's what we have to bring the signal up to. So the current through R2 or R1, we want to be greater than or equal to 10 times the current through the base at quiescence that we just calculated. More is better, it's wasteful, but does not hurt. So we're just saying at least 10. That's just a rule of thumb. Make it higher if you want, make it lower if you want, do some tests. But the one hard fact I can tell you is 10 times generally works and more is safer as long as you can spare to waste the power. So this is bad on a battery powered device, something plugged into the wall, you can just say, it's a premium product, it uses more power, deal with it. So if we want the current to be greater than or equal to, that means we want the resistor to be less than or equal to, less resistance, more current. Make some room. So R2 is less than or equal to your V bias 
over 10 times your quiescent base voltage, your quiescent base current. V bias is also VR2. This is why we're finding this one first, because we know what VR2 should be because it's VRE plus VBE 1.7. So we know that, which means we know the voltage here. We know the current that we want at least 10 times that. V equals I times R, so R equals V over I. So you just calculate that out and you get whatever value, round it down to the next value for a resistor that you have in your box. For me, that was 1800 ohms. And then over here we do the same equation, which I wish I hadn't just erased. R1 less than or equal to V over R1, V of R1 rather, 10 times the base quiescent current. So it's just R1 instead of R2, which got me, once I round down, once again for safety, to about 8200 ohms. And then over here I forgot to calculate RE, but it doesn't matter because we can do it now instead of then. Variety is the spice of life. So RE equals, remember it's voltage over current, so voltage is VRE. So in our case that's 1, we just decided it's 1. And then the current is ICQ plus I. BQ. So it's the quiescent current through the collector, the quiescent current through the base. So that was our 8.5 milliamps, which was halfway between 17 milliamps to max and zero. And then IBQ, we decided, was 85 microamps, because that's 8.5 milliamps over beta, or 185 microamps. So add those two together, and I got 116, or rounded up this time, because more voltage drop reduces our gain, but is better safety factor. So round up RE to 120 ohms, and that's it. So you decide your supply voltage, you decide your load resistance, you decide your voltage across RE, one is safe. So you get your maximum current, half of that is your quiescent safe current. Decide on a beta of 100 for a BJT, that gets you your base quiescent current. You can use the base and collector quiescent currents to calculate the resistor value here. You use 10 times the base current, at least, calculate plus the voltage, we decided here, plus here, so 0.7 plus 1, 1.7. So you get the minimum current you want going through here. You already know the voltage because it's 1.7. Calculate your resistor, round down to get more current. This is just the other one. So do the calculation with the other voltage, round down to a resistor value you have in your box. That's it. Stick some capacitors in there, all of the same value. Start with 10 microfarads or 100 nanofarads and try it out. Change if it doesn't work. And then add your third capacitor of the same. They all three should be the same. Add this capacitor if you want to bring your gain back up. So you can just write all that down, use it whenever you want. And of course, there will be many more types of amplifier in the future, but right now, I'm going to go do more research and also take a lozenge because my throat hurts. Being sick sucks. So while I go do that, I'll be seeing you.